Today's first special reading comes from the book, A Wrinkle in Time, by Madeline Lingle, Chapter 5. Something in Mrs. Witch's voice made all three of the children stand straighter, throwing back their shoulders with determination, looking at the glimmer that was Mrs. Witch with pride and confidence. And we're not alone, you know, children, came Mrs. Wetzett, the comforter. All through the universe, it's being fought, all through the cosmos, and my, but it's a grand and exciting battle. I know it's hard for you to understand about size, how there's very little difference in the size of the teeniest microbe and the greatest galaxy. You think about that, and maybe it won't seem strange to you that some of our very best fighters have come right from your own planet. And it's a little planet, dears, out on the edge of the little galaxy. You can be proud that it's done so well. Who have our fighters been, Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear, Mrs. Wetzett said. Mrs. Who's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly. And let the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, Charles Wallop said, why, of course, Jesus. Of course, Mrs. Watson said. Go on, Charles, love. There were others, all your great artists. They've been lights for us to see by. Leonardo da Vinci, Calvin suggested tentatively, and Michelangelo, and Shakespeare, Charles Wallace called out, and Bach and Pasteur, Madame Curie and Einstein. Now Calvin's voice rang with confidence. And Schweitzer, and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Beethoven, and Rembrandt, and St. Francis. Here ends the reading. Let us learn from these examples of heroes as we seek to fight injustice everywhere. Beautifully done. Thank you for that. The scripture lesson from today comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to Jesus along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, We know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then Jesus said to them, whose head is this on the coin and whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. Then Jesus said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that belong to the emperor and to God the things that belong to God. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Today is Welcome Sunday, the culmination of a couple months of planning to formalize the relationship between my wife Lindsay and I with this congregation as I step into the pastor role and then we begin thinking together about what the future will look like. It's Welcome Sunday despite how we've met already, at least most of us, despite having begun the process of learning about one another, our interests, our passions and values our dreams for what the congregation is and hopes to be. My generation has a term for this sort of formal celebration. We call it going Facebook official. (laughs) If something is Facebook official, it's gone beyond an organic, undefined thing into a full-fledged role. If something is Facebook official, it's public and visible, and it's also open to comments, suggestions, and feedbacks from other people. The heat is on, in other words. 
That visibility can be intimidating, but commitment is a cool thing. And so last night, Lindsay and I had a blast spending some time with each of you. And this morning, Lindsay sends her love from the classroom at the synagogue where she teaches seasonally throughout the year. Before we begin in earnest, and I don't normally do this, uh, although Reverend Petty does when he's here, let us pray together something that's just been on my mind. God of welcome, be welcome in our hearts today as we have listened to and will respond to the words of Scripture. Every reading is an invitation to action. Teach us how to best apply what we've learned. Amen. When I was in first grade, my class had an award ceremony at the end of the year to recognize our academic achievements. First grade was actually my first year in school. Um, I didn't attend preschool, and I skipped kindergarten. So that first year was really tough for me. There was a lot of transition. It was the year I learned, like many kids that age, that the best way to get out of going to school is to fake a stomach ache, not a fever, because it takes too much work to get the thermometer at the right temperature. It was also the year that I won the citizenship award for my grade. When my name was called at the gymnasium assembly, I genuinely had no idea what citizenship was. But like the good and humble child I was, I liked the way everyone was clapping for me and smiling at me. I was a modest child. I later learned, as any teacher here can probably tell you, that the citizenship award is for students who display kindness, obedience, and team effort in and outside of the classroom. Good citizens are good classmates. They work hard, but they don't show off. They share, they listen as carefully as they can, and so on. It's an interesting lesson to learn as a first grader, the qualities of good citizenship. For one thing, citizenship in the classroom probably looks a little bit different from citizenship in the voting booth, or citizenship with activism. Sometimes good citizenship as an adult can look like obedience, respect to authority. Other times, good citizenship involves offering criticism, new perspectives, even outright rejections of the status quo in order to affect necessary change. Think about the founding fathers of this country, men and women who were intelligent, hardworking, and dedicated to the idea of a country where they might be heard by their leadership. Were they bad citizens for speaking out against the English king? Was the Revolutionary War all just a big mistake because they didn't follow the rules? Now, I doubt anyone here would or should say they'd prefer we had just stayed English. I mean, the tea's good, but still. The American experiment is an exciting one with a rich and, yes, tumultuous history. So it's a cool thing to have inherited it. But in order to get America, we had to do some things that don't really seem like good citizenship. At least not if always doing what our leaders tell us is the mark of a good citizen. On the other hand, if we always buck trends and tradition and leadership, if there isn't some structure, some chain of command, some mutual responsibility that you have to me and I have to you, well then what's the point? If I can always go off and do whatever I want, and you can do the same, then what's the point of coming together and forming a country in the first place? It's good to have norms, to have guidelines to follow in treating one another and our country with respect. What do those norms and guidelines look like? Who should we listen to? The folks in this week's scripture lesson were grappling with that very problem. There was no such thing as a Christian church just yet, but Jesus and his followers had already gained a little bit of a reputation for stirring up trouble. So naturally, someone, in this case in an effort to trap Jesus, asked the question, are you out to overthrow Caesar? They didn't put it quite so bluntly, but the scriptures paint a picture of the religious leaders at the time hoping to catch Jesus saying something disrespectful. So they set him up. Is it lawful, they asked, to pay taxes? Now, to us, it may seem like a silly question. After all, while I imagine that none of us is particularly fond of seeing that number on our pay stub shrink just a little bit each time taxes are taken out, most of us, maybe all of us, understand money doesn't grow on trees, 
and our institutions of law and government depend on money to build infrastructure, to pay salaries, and so on. But there's more to this week's question. See, Jesus was a Jew, and the Jewish people living under Roman rule weren't actually considered citizens of Rome. They weren't exactly slaves, like the Hebrews in Egypt, but they were definitely considered inferior to the rest of the Roman Empire. A citizen of Rome, who also paid taxes, had certain rights and protections and status. A Jew living in Roman-occupied territory was just that, a Jew. Someone with a strange culture, strange habits and language and religion, just strange. And yet, the Jews were still forced to pay taxes to Caesar, a contentious point that had led to talk of rebellion, of the possibility that a small Jewish army might rise up to kick the Romans out of Jerusalem once and for all, and then hopefully out of the rest of Palestine one day. And there were those who believed that the job of the Jewish Messiah, whenever he or she got around to coming, would be to do just that. So when talk started spreading that Jesus might actually be this Messiah, it was met with a combination of skepticism and fear and hope. The religious leaders were skeptical. The general public was afraid of a possible rebellion, another violent conflict they couldn't really afford. And yet, there were some who hoped beyond hope that Jesus would get them out of this whole Roman mess. So the question, should we pay taxes to Caesar, is incredibly loaded. Because depending on how Jesus answers this question, he's bound to alienate some of his audience. If he says, well, yes, we must pay our taxes, it's our duty as citizens, then many folks would inevitably peg him as a Roman sympathizer a fan of Roman rule, someone willing to submit to a government that saw him as a second-class person, not even really a citizen at all. If Jesus said, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, then Jesus was effectively declaring war on Rome. And while that would certainly make some of his audience happy and willing to follow him into battle, there would be a lot of mothers losing their sons, a lot of blood and sweat and likely defeat. In fact, when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was actually destroyed just after the time of Christ, that's exactly how it happened. There was an incalculable loss of life, culture, and dignity, and all because of a rebellion. Which is why Jesus' response is so powerful. He ignores the question completely in order to bring his audience back to the center of his message. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, as the King James Version says, isn't a cop-out. It's not Jesus throwing in the towel. It's an acknowledgement of the very real, very dangerous, in some cases, power of Rome in the occupied Jewish territories. And it's also the admission that the teachings of Jesus go beyond whatever immediate political climate there is to affect hearts and minds in ways that transcend this faction or that party. It speaks to the situation of the time, but it also speaks to us today, more than 2,000 years later. What an answer. The central conflict in this scripture lesson is about citizenship. What does it mean to be a good citizen in wider society? For Jesus and his followers, like for each one of us, the answer is complicated. It's messy. It's not easily answered with a to-do list of things that you have to do or you shouldn't do. Quite the opposite. Like I mentioned earlier, citizenship often means saying and doing unpopular things just to critique the system into doing better. It doesn't mean you've given up on the system. You're just working within it. Because it's Welcome Sunday, it seemed fitting this morning to share something of my own life and story, but rather than giving you a long, dry, autobiographical sketch, I decided instead to use three readings, the first of which we've already heard. And these are readings that mean something special to me, readings that have kept me going in good times and bad, readings that often spring to mind when I think of wisdom and insight from the world's great thinkers. What's more, and this is why it's relevant today, not just as Welcome Sunday. Each writing embodies, embodies rather, an example of citizenship in a different way. For the first reading, Madeline Langle, 
We have an author who defied the odds by writing a children's book steeped in Christianity. And despite receiving insult after insult for suggesting to the horror of some audiences that Christians have a responsibility to try and respect other cultures. Gasp. <laughs> Nevertheless, Langle insisted on a loving, welcoming kind of Christianity, and her books have gone on to inspire generations of new readers and longtime readers, too. She was, by the way, a music director for a UCC congregation many years ago, though she later found her home in the Episcopal Church uh, in New York, St. John the Divine. I suspect some of the UCC's culture of welcome and warmth influenced her thinking, though to what extent we can never really be sure. The second writing that we're going to hear comes from James Joyce, probably my favorite of all authors, whose book, Ulysses, was banned on obscenity charges until a series of rulings across Europe and the United States made the book widely available to the public. Now, Joyce was labeled a bad citizen by many people until it was realized that the war over his novel was actually a victory for free speech, at which point he became a hero. The last reading will come from St. Augustine of Hippo, an early bishop of the Christian church living just 300 years after the time of Christ. Augustine was groomed from an early age to be a rhetor, a kind of combination entertainer, political figure, and lawyer. Now, rhetors were the movie stars of their time because they were really good storytellers. With the neat addition that unlike many movie stars today, they were considered intellectually rigorous brilliant, and often egotistical as a result. Augustine was a model Roman citizen, but he threw his career away to pursue life in the new Christian church. And he spent the rest of his life criticizing, among other things, the idea of a church too connected to governments. Some would call him a saint, others a madman, especially when political power for the church would be a serious advantage. All three figures demonstrate citizenship differently. All three had friends, and all three had plenty of enemies. I mentioned Facebook before I began. Making something Facebook official, hitting that publish button, comes with wider exposure. And when something's visible, it's open to criticism. Lately, it seems we've become, as citizens, more polarized, more quick to judge one another, more apt to get political at every turn, we criticize leaders, we criticize followers, we criticize friends and family, we criticize those who protest, and we criticize those who don't. We criticize those who stand, we criticize those who kneel. In this teeming mass of citizens, there's more than enough criticism to go around, for better and worse. Perhaps the trick to dealing with all this criticism all the time lies in Jesus' answer. Perhaps the trick is realizing that not everything can be solved by being on the right side of a particular political issue, and that we are more than just our political identities. Maybe there's less difference, maybe not, between our sides than we think. But either way, when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he's not saying that debate or discussion or even disagreement are irrelevant. No, they matter. But he's saying that they won't necessarily solve everything. And hinging our entire future, as well as our friendships and our families, on the success or failure of one or even many political arguments will only lead to emptiness in the long run. Jesus doesn't want to create the misconception that his message, his way of life, is only for the folks who feel a certain way about the system. It's for everybody. Just like how on this welcoming Sunday, as a congregation, we want to send the message that this place is a place for everyone. The welcome Lindsay and I felt when we first came to services together just a couple months ago, that's the welcome that Lindsay, ex uh, that Christ, excuse me, although sometimes I call her God, <laughs> whew, that's the welcome that Christ extended to all, I'm not going to live that one down, <laughs> is this recording? and then asked us to continue down through the centuries to this very day. It's a welcome for all people. It's a kind of model citizenship all its own, but instead of belonging to a kingdom that's just of the here and now, 
It's practice for being a citizen of the kingdom of God, a kingdom not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. With that in mind, save me a seat, okay? Amen. Please rise and join me in the affirmation of our mission statement. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. Thank you. You may be seated. The second special reading comes from the book Ulysses by James Joyce, in particular the fifth episode, Lotus Eaters. Mr. Bloom had reached the open back door of All Hallows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat. The cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door, and entered softly. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters around their necks, heads bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stood aside, watching their blind masks pass down the aisle one by one and seek their places. Mr. Bloom approached a bench and seated himself in the corner, nursing his hat and newspaper. He saw the priest stow the communion cup away and kneel an instant before it. The priest was rinsing out the chalice, then he tossed off the drag smartly. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music today, pity. Who has the organ here, I wonder? Some of that old sacred music is splendid. Mozart's Twelfth Mass, the Gloria in that. Those old popes were keen on music, on art and statues and pictures of all kinds. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him and then stood up, looking over the risen hats. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass boy answered each other in Latin. The priest play, prayed, Blessed Michael, Archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust Satan down, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world to the ruin of souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over? Here ends the reading. May our own worship, as different as it is from this, be thoughtful as we are made wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Today's third special reading comes from the book of Confessions by St. Augustine. Oh my God, let me with thanksgiving remember and confess unto you your mercies on me. Let my bones be showered with love and say, Who is like you, O Lord? And I will declare, and all who worship you, when they hear this, will say, Blessed be the Lord in heaven and in earth. Great and wonderful is his name. Your word stuck fast in my heart, and I was hedged around about all, on all sides by you. Of your eternal life, I was now certain, though I saw it as through a glass. But for my earthly life, all was wavering. The Savior himself was well pleased, well pleased me, but as I shrunk from going through its straightness. For I saw the church full, and one went this way and another that way. I was displeased that I led a secular life, now that my desires no longer inflamed me as of old with hopes of honor and profit. A grievous burden it was to undergo so heavy a bondage. For in comparison of your sweetness and the beauty of your house which I loved, these things delighted me no longer. Here ends the reading. May our own understanding of God be deepened and made full by the wisdom of great women and men of the past. 